safety, then seek six day one, find my place. Let's get down to work. Uh, any questions, comments from the reading or our journey so far? Yes, Eddie. Do you think the Crusades are a consciously direct response to the Moorish invasion of, of Spain? You know, it's possible. It's possible. I don't know how much time elapsed between the one and the other. Um, you know, slavery is traumatic. One of the things that uh, we could, could talk about, but I definitely do talk about uh, next term, um, is uh, epigenetics. Have you heard of that? Okay. So basically epigenetics uh, from a, a certain point of view where ancestral memory is stored as memory and passed on unconsciously or consciously. Um, you know, slavery was traumatic. It doesn't matter that they let you read and write and teach you to read and write and give you a fairly decent job and feed you. You know, it's still traumatic. Being a sex slave is traumatic. However, you know, if you, for example, Google that term, Odalisk, I decided not to use any of those images because even though they're classical things, because, you know, de depicting women as nude, and, wait, they're sex slaves and they're harem. Yeah. Um, objects. Yeah, objects. They're still objects. Slavery is slavery. I'm not saying that it's better because black people are doing it, even though black people's slaves, you know, were read, you know, reading and writing. Uh, that's slightly better than America, but not great, <laughs> you know, if I'm going to be completely intellectually honest about that. So, um, I didn't learn about Europeans being enslaved from European history. <laughs> you don't learn that in America, right? So it's a book written by a British historian who's reading Arabic. And he's reading it at a time when um, what is happening, and we'll, when we get to that particular time period, Europe is basically dividing up Africa. <laughs> for slavery and for exploitation. <clears throat> and because uh, it's the end of the Ottoman Empire and they can do that without much opposition. So is, you know, were the Crusades revenge for slavery? Uh, it's hard to say. I wouldn't doubt it. Wouldn't doubt it. At least it could be an element within the larger yeah. picture. Yeah, it, it's, it's entirely possible. But, you know, since they don't talk about that, <laughs> you can't actually definitively claim that. You know, it's very similar to, um, you know, so for example, uh, and when we get to this time period, and it's not till next year, but I can basically, you know, parenthetically say it, because I actually gave a speech about it, you know, a couple of times recently. The dominant mythology about the Ku Klux Klan and Eugene according to historians who basically go through a standard of evidence, right? Like, did it appear in a newspaper? Do you have a picture? Et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Well, we're not gonna believe your word. <clears throat> okay, so according to that, right, the Klan died in 1924. But the people who say that were Klan controlled. <laughs> so can we trust the Klan to inform them on the Klan? Uh, no. But on the other hand, a historian who's not down with the Klan basically has to go on the evidence. In ethnic studies, we have different standards of evidence where we basically say, look, people who were there who lived and experienced it, you know, say that this and this and this happened. To which the historian will reply, <clears throat> Uh, well, people are willing to use the imagery of the clan to achieve the same effect, and we can't say that it's the clan. Even if we have a membership list, because not everybody who's a clan member is on the membership list, and lots of people who are on the membership list might not be a clan, actual clansmen. 
uh, I'm not sure how you justify that last statement, but it is a quote, and I'm just, you know, repeating it. So, yeah, um, yeah. When Bin Laden said that 9/11 was because of the West involvement in creating a secular Turkey, okay, that's 80 years before. <laughs> you serious? Really? I mean, I would have believed revenge for getting bombed in Afghanistan. That I would have believed. Turkey, that's a stretch. But a lot of folks within that particular axiology have long memories. You know, I mean, black people ain't about to give up, you know, slavery. No, get over slavery. Uh, no, not so much. We ain't going to do that. So if we're not going to go get over slavery, why would bin Laden get over Turkey? from 80 years ago. Because like our foreign policy has been playing those games since way before that. Yeah, yeah, it's true. It is very true. So let me find my <coughs> place. Christian Discovery, Crusades, Starry Decisis, Foundations of Whiteness. That was the last one. Last. Ah, uh, right. Okay. We talked about Blumenbach. Maybe not yet. All right. Bringing the light to the unwashed masses. Let's start there. Oh, and by the way, um, it's midterm day, so I'll be handing those out. And for those of you in online land, it will be up after 3 o'clock today on the Moodle site. It's take home open book. So the book is not only what's ever in Asante, but also um, all the PowerPoints. It's also a fair game, too. And you have a week to complete it. It's due back um, close of business, i.e., 5 o'clock next Wednesday. Uh, Monday, we're not meeting because it's President's Day. All right, so there we go. Go to slide, please. So, if you're going to found a concept where uh, you're going to create racial supremacy, you have to create a concept of race to be able to do that. I mean, people can notice differences, but um, there wasn't really a documented uh, concept of racism. So, just going back, for example, to... Um, say the, the Ku Klux Klan, uh, do you only believe the written documentation if somebody burns a cross on your lawn on 9-11 or a week after 9-11, is that Klan activity? If somebody phones in a bomb threat uh, at the Martin Luther King celebration because Martin Luther King III is there, <coughs> this is 1988, in Eugene, and he says, I'm the Ku Klux Klan and we're phoning in a bomb threat, is that really the Ku Klux Klan? Uh, or <laughs> would they bother? Hmm, maybe, maybe not. Who knows? But they're willing to, you know, use the cover, right? So you can't have whiteness without a concept of race yet. And so part of that foundation that we'll often see with starting uh, with various types of infrastructure is you start with a mandate from God and helps if... You help God write or edit the mandate. And part of that mandate starts with not only, it starts definitely before the King James Version of the Bible, right, with the Inquisition, as we were lo looking at last uh, Monday, uh, with, you know, the Catholic Church basically saying Christians are white and we're going to persecute you because you have Moorish or Jewish blood, by which we understand darker skin. Otherwise, how do you know that? King James Version of the Bible. So, James gathers 12 white scholars who, in their edit job, basically leave out about 200 books, especially those with African reference, changes the biblical references, for example, with words like tyrant, where it says the word is actually tyrant, and they change it to kings. So, yeah, okay. And they use Hebrew and Greek, but not Aramaic. 
as the source text. Okay, I mean, I guess it's a call. You know, the editors can do whatever they want. So the religious authority and the secular authority enforce God's will on earth. And by the way, God's will is what we've edited to say. And this is basically in line with the Council of Nicaea, who is doing essentially the same thing. You know, in 300, uh, 370, I guess it is, right? Just before the fall of Rome. We're going to basically set this down as this is what Christian doctrine is going to be. And so James simply reinforces that. But the reason I'm putting out, you know, and not so much putting down the King James Version of the Bible is that both the Ku Klux Klan and Martin Luther King use this as the basis for their actions, as well as colonialists in America. So Christian supremacy and Christian in this concept, the meme, Christian means white only. And then we start looking at the whole issue around blood or racial purity. That is, you know, you're pure white or you're pure black, and basically we don't want mixtures of the races. So this becomes the meme where you hear it, where I've heard it in America. Well, God made the races separate on different continents, and uh, they're supposed to be kept separate. Well, wait a minute. What about the fact that people have boats and <laughs> people can migrate? <laughs> if they're separate, <laughs> what? God don't want them to walk? <laughs> I mean, right? It does. The logic falls apart, right? So. Just understand, racism doesn't necessarily mean, it may be illogical, it may not make sense, but people believe it anyway, and it doesn't mean that it's no less powerful just because it's fictional. So, basically then, the superior civilizing influence of quote-unquote Western civilization, where Western itself means white, as we saw in the dictionary definitions, Okay, Northern European or North and South America, et cetera, et cetera. Um, well, wait, not the indigenous people? Oh, so Western means white. Okay. Occidental versus Oriental, that's also, you know, from England, the Occident. And then the concept of bringing the light, that is the light of our new form of Christianity, to the unwashed masses, that is, you know, the heathen, the people living out in the sticks, the people living out in the heather, the pagan, the etc. Right? So, once you have the religious and political authorities on the same page, then, uh, as we had talked about Monday, the whole doctrine of discovery, you know, when Columbus discovered America, we weren't taught, and I wasn't taught, so I know you weren't taught, that discovery was a legal process. <clears throat> oh, you thought, oh, it was just, I found this. Well, no. I found it and, you know, it's like Wade Noble said, I don't know who you are, but you Indians now. And because you Indians, uh, you lost title to your own land, your ancestral homeland. Doesn't matter that you've been living there since, well, at least 10,000 years before Columbus got there. So it's long enough to be considered your homeland, oh, you lose it. The academy then, see the explorers claim territory for crown and church. All right, and then the academy weighs in to give secular justification. So, for example, Johann Friedrich Blumenbach at Göttingen writes in 1770, a racial classification, Caucasian, Caucasoid, Mongoloid, Negroid, and this is based on the Bible. Because the ark, Noah's ark landed, and of course Noah was white. Why, well, just look at the Russell Crowe movie, right? <laughs> <laughs> Or Exodus, you know, Christian Bale, looks like Moses. Yeah, sure. <laughs> yeah, Caucasus, you know, the, because of the, the ark landed on Mount Ararat in the Caucasus Mountains, the, the people who descended from Noah are white people, Caucasoid. 
and then they moved into Asia and devolved further from the superior white race, and they're mongoloid, and then people devolve from there, and it's a negroid. So, right, God clearly made white people superior and black people inferior, and that's why, oh, well, let's forget about the pyramids. Let's forget about your book coming out of Africa. Let's forget about all that stuff. Yeah. So they're trying to really try to justify kind of reverse evolution. Yes. Which is Essentially, story. right. Reverse evolution, right? So, I mean, that's why when we saw, you know, at the beginning of class that, you know, from that Christian website about you have, you know, you know, the anthropoid, the <clears throat> hominids, and then, you know, on the right, white man. Um, well, wait a minute. <laughs> You don't believe in evolution, but you believe in your supremacy. Why is that? Hmm. So, George II. So, House of Hanover. George II. Uh, so, it's George I, George II, George III. The House of Hanover from Germany uh, rules on the throne of England. George II imports Blumenbach's uh, ideas, and, among others, that university's curriculum to England. Um, where, yeah. Where is Blumenbach from? He's German at Göttingen. Which was a university. Yeah, a major university. In fact, you know, one of the, you know, if you were to translate in the concept of, um, you know, the U of O and OSU having a rivalry, right. Göttingen had a famous, um, Rivalry with another German school like Heidelberg or something like that. Oxford and Cambridge. Yeah, Oxford and Cambridge. Harvard right, and right. Harvard and yeah, right. Right. <laughs> <laughs> right. You know, these universities, there's this tradition. It's an interesting in terms of having rivalries. Who's better? You know, who's who's the smartest? Who, who makes the best discoverer? Yeah. Who, who can do that, right? So anyway, that curriculum basically gets imported to England from Germany because it's a German ruler on the throne, right? And what's he going to decree, right? And so you're going to send... So the issue then becomes, not the issue so much, but does it not then follow that what's the curriculum going to be imported to the English colonies? Hmm. <laughs> right? Canada and America. Right? Tommy, Jeff, and those folks, they were, you know, educated in universities on American soil, but what would that curriculum have been? This one, the Columbus Discovered America narrative. All right, so thence it comes to America for the education of the colonies. And, you know, there are exceptional others in other races and they are exceptional, not like others of their race, because, quote, they are like us. And uh, we'll talk about Afro-Europeans, maybe later this hour, but certainly later in the, um, either next week or something like that. But, yes, you know, starting with the foundation of whiteness. So, understand that these Germ Germans, French, Europe itself, these countries were not wholly white. They had people of color, they had black people. So people of color does not just mean black people, even though a lot of people would like to think that. You know, they're people of multiple races because these folks have colonies. And the colonies, you know, they colonized, you know, other places, particularly Africa. So those colonials had come to Europe to live and mix and intermarry. Plus, black people have been coming up into Europe since easily a thousand, and definitely during the Dark Ages, as well as before. So these, these, Europe is not white. <clears throat> not totally white. So, and because, you know, these folks are like us, that is, they've assimilated or acculturated into our ways that proves that our supremacy. So, starting with the foundations of American <coughs> whiteness. So that's the philosophical basis for European whiteness. So, starting in 1619, 
This is where, you, so you notice, as, as of course, one of the reasons you're taking the class is I don't start in 1619 like everybody else does. Start in 15,000. <laughs> it's better, more better, right? But starting in 1619, Turtle Island, North America was populated by Indian nations, European colonists, European indentured servants, white and black, African slaves, Indian slaves, and so-called free Negroes, some of them living alongside whites, some of them living in maroon communities and republics. So, for example, indentured servants. So the indenture is you pay, your passage to America gets paid, but you have to work it off. Pretty much like a slave. So indentured servants could be beaten and flogged, raped, etc., by their masters and as bad as slaves could be. With the difference being slaves were considered property. Yeah, indentured servants were almost property too, but they were, they were property working off their debt. So as soon as their debt was paid, they're free. So these servants, white, black, <coughs> female, male, as well as Indians, would often find common cause and rebelled against the wealthy upper classes, which were, of course, always, almost always white. So, for example, I don't know if I have this particular graphic here. It might fly it in for next week. But you've heard of Wall Street. You know where Wall, what Wall Street was? I think it was literally a wall to keep the other elements out. Well, which other elements? Native Americans. <laughs> yeah, but okay, let me, I'm going to, I'm not a geographer, I'm a psych, a psych major, right? So this graphic that I have, this is like Lower Manhattan. I don't know if you've ever been to Lower Manhattan. I've been to Lower Manhattan, right? It's kind of like, why don't I have markers that work? up in here. Slightly better. Okay. <laughs> Let's say this is Lower Manhattan. And this is Wall Street. So Manhattan's an island in the middle of Iroquois Six Nations territory like the entire state of New York, Connecticut, etc., etc. You know, it's like the old, you know, Lone Ranger jo joke. Tonto, we're surrounded by Indians. What do you mean, we, white man? <laughs> All right, so Wall Street, okay. The wall was built by European and African indentured servants to keep Indians out but not only Indians out, to keep them from escaping. Okay, because remember, this island is surrounded. <laughs> you know, I mean, the whole thing about, oh, buying the land, the Dutch selling, you know, the land to these folks for $24 worth of wampum beads. Well, wait, first of all, the people that you sold it to, they weren't even from there. That's one. Two... Natives don't believe in real estate. So maybe you were trading for the right to be there for a little while or giving a gift, but no, you don't own the island, but whatever, they got discovered, so the title passed, right? So this wall here is to keep Indians out. Wait, you're surrounded. The island is surrounded. They could go anywhere, make landfall anywhere. So, the concept, so really, it's not so much to keep the natives out as to keep these folks in. Go back to slide. And these folks, we're talking about servants who are getting beaten, white, black, male, female. It's to keep them from escaping into Indian country. Because they did. And they would. Because the Indians themselves didn't want, well, one, they were being, they, you know, it was women who were running the country, so to speak, the clan mothers of, Iro of the Iroquois Confederacy, 
and any black white male or black female or white female who made it into Indian country was free. You could stay and become a full-fledged member of the tribe, not be beaten or anything, and live among them because the Indians weren't giving them back. So that's really more the, the purpose of the wall. Plus, and this is a conjecture on my part, I will own it. The reason native nations had to be destroyed was because of their acceptance of diversity and their belief in an economy where you didn't have poor people. And that no homeless people, no poor people, no starving people, no racism, no sexism, Women did not get sexually abused. Children did not get physically abused. There was not public drunkenness. People bathed every day. But, I mean, all kinds of things that weren't happening in the fledgling colony. So as in the living example of, hey, there's a better way than what you're offering here in America that's older than what the fledgling colony would be, we need to get rid of that example. Yeah. With no profit motive. With no profit motive, because, no, why would you have a profit motive? Who do you not feed? Who do you let starve? Right. So, white women and Africans would escape in Indian country. In Virginia, so the foundations of American whiteness start in Virginia. Everything starts in Virginia. It's really interesting. A series of laws was enacted which would later establish what we call whiteness, at least in America, a series of interlocking and invisible privileges based on race, gender, and class, among other things. So, for example, 1640. So, 20 years after that first 1619. So, that Dutch ship that brought 20 Africans, they were indentured servants, not slaves. They were Dutch citizens, therefore citizens. They were Europeans because, you know, black people have been going up to the Netherlands since the Holy Roman Empire, since the Inquisition, because that was part of the Holy Roman Empire. The, the Netherlands, Germany, etc. So, 1640, three indentured servants in New Amsterdam, that's New York, one black, two white, ran away from their master. When they were caught and brought before the court, the court adds a number of years to the white man's indenture and then sentences the black man to servitude for life. Okay, so they're indentured servants, which means they're Dutch citizens in New Amsterdam. And here we see the beginnings of unequal justice for the same crime. Okay, the not law never recognizes racial differences at that time. There were no precedents. So remember what I said the other day about stare decisis, let the decision stand. There had never been a decision like this before. But this started the precedent of a racial bifurcation in the law. Sixteen seventy, the Virginia Assembly forbids free Negroes and Indians to own Christian white servants. And so that's literally it. Christian means white in their mind. Which, okay, this meme has now been going for close to two hundred years at this point. Christian means white. Now, again, if you understand our original position, what's the problem? You don't forbid something that isn't happening. It has to be happening to forbid it. Right? So, obviously, there are free Negroes and Native Americans who, had, who can own, by paying whatever the coin of the realm is, to own servants. All right? So, indentured servants, service could be bought by anyone who paid money. So free Negroes could only have come from Africa or Europe. Most likely Europe, because why would we come from Africa to New England? 
Er. Cuba? Yeah. <laughs> Costa Rica? South America? Yeah. In this time, before the quote-unquote invention of whiteness in America, white people were called Christians. Obviously, the existence of other form of the African and Eastern version of Christianity had been forgotten by Western civilization, because Western is again a code name for white. So those things, those churches continued, but were not necessarily, well, they are written out of the history. So, in 1676, it's legal to enslave Indians, which is pretty deep, because you're in Indian country, and Iroquois, Six Nations, are a military power. That takes some cojones. 1680, white Christians allowed to give any Negro or other slave 30 lashes for raising a hand to a Christian. 1705, Virginia forbids whipping white servants naked. I guess they have to wear clothes. All property owned by black slaves, including livestock, <coughs> is confiscated by the church, the church, Hmm. And sold to poor whites requires masters to give white servants at the end of their indenture corn, money, gun, clothing, 50 acres of land, and reduced poll tax. And you could only vote if you don't, don't know poll taxes from the days of Jim Crow segregation and illegal voting. You could only vote if you had money to pay the poll tax. And uh, if you've seen the movie Selma, yeah, like they would make you pay a poll tax. If you registered to vote, they'd make you pay a poll tax for every year that you didn't register. Now, there are some that think that this is ap apocryphal, that is, it's myth mythological. But you will see that if it is a fiction, it certainly resembles actual practice. So, Willie Lynch um, was a planter from uh, the West Indies who had slaves, and you, do, you must understand that just like Jews resisted Hitler, and fought back, black people are not going into chains willingly, and once they get here in America, they're constantly revolting. Constantly. So, for example, my ex is from Virginia, and one of the reasons that you see tons of buildings built with brick is because black people used to burn them down. In, in slavery. <laughs> Brick is harder to burn. Though you, you might have wooden floors, etc. Right? So, constantly having problems. So, the Willie Lynch letter. So, Willie Lynch is a planter brought to uh, Jamestown and for a little, um, shall we say, consultant. He was a consultant brought in to deal with the slave problem, as you'll see. Gentlemen, I greet you here on the bank of the James River in the year of our Lord, 1712. First, I shall thank you, the gentlemen of the colony of Virginia, for bringing me here. I'm here to help you solve some of your problems with slaves. Your invitation reached me on my modest plantation in the West Indies, where I have experimented with some of the newest and still the oldest methods for control of slaves. Ancient Rome would envy us if my program is implemented as our boat sailed south on the James River, named for our illustrious king, whose version of the Bible we cherish. I saw enough to know that your problem is not unique. While Rome used cords of wood as crosses for standing human bodies along the old highways in great numbers, you are using the tree and the rope on occasion. Now, this is not, he is not the lynch that invented the term lynching. That was Captain John Lynch, also of Virginia, who was basically a law enforcement officer who, when they basically organized posses, 
to go catch criminals, they would basically catch the criminals and either beat them or hang them upon the spot. Hence the term lynching. This is, Willie Lynch is a different lynch. No relation. I caught the whiff of a dead slave hanging from a, a tree a couple of miles back. You're not only lo losing valuable stock, that's livestock, that's slaves, by hangings, you are also having, you are having uprisings. Slaves are running away, your crops are sometimes left in the field too long for maximum profit, you suffer occasional fires, your animals are killed. Gentlemen, you know what your problems are, I do not need to elaborate. I'm not here to enumerate your problems, I'm here to introduce you to a method of solving them. In my bag here, I have a foolproof method for controlling your black slaves. I guarantee every one of you, if installed correctly, it will control your slaves for at least 300 years. My method is simple and members of your family or any overseer can use it. I have outlined a number of differences among the slaves and I take these differences and make them bigger. I use fear, distrust, and envy for control purposes. These methods have worked on my modest plantation in the West Indies, and it will work throughout the South. T take this simple list of, of differences, think about them. On top of my list is age, but it's only there because it starts with an A. The second is color or shade. There is intelligence, size, sex, size of plantation, status on plantation, attitude of owner, whether the slaves live in the valley or on a hill, east, west, north, south, have fine or coarse hair, or is tall or short. Now that you have a list of differences, I shall give you an outline of action. But before that, I shall assure you that distrust is stronger than trust, and envy is stronger than adulation, respect, or admiration. The black slave, after receiving this indoctrination, shall carry on, emphasis mine here, by the way, and will become self-refueling and self-generating for hundreds of years, maybe thousands. Don't forget, you must pitch the old black versus the young black male, and the young black male against the old black male. You must use the dark-skinned slaves versus the light-skinned slaves, and the light-skinned slaves versus the dark-skinned slaves. You must also have our white servants and overseers distrust all blacks, but it is necessary that your slaves trust and depend on us. They must love, respect, and trust only us. Gentlemen, these kits are your keys to control. Use them. Have your wives and children use them. Never miss an opportunity. My plan is guaranteed, and the good thing about this plan is that if used intensely for one year, the slaves themselves will remain perpetually distrustful. Thank you, gentlemen. There are some that say Lynch's letter is, well, somebody made it up. But if it isn't real, it is sure as if it were implemented. So, his strategy is basic, divide and conquer. And he's not that lynched like where lynching came from. Captain John Lynch. So, after the Willie Lynch letter, so again, just think about this as a meme. Memes don't have to be true. They just are successful or not. And this as a meme, you know, worked. And even if it, somebody made it up in the 20th century, hmm, sure looks like it got implemented before then. 1723, free Negroes lose the right to vote, bear arms, or bear witness in court. Thomas Jefferson, good old Tommy founding father Jeff, drafts a law in Virginia which, if enacted, didn't get enacted, would have put black freedmen and freed women or a white woman who bore a mulatto child, mulatto being the term for a first-generation black-white mix, outside of the law if they rem remained in the Commonwealth more than a year. So in other words, remained in Virginia. 
Outside the law means you be, can be killed by anyone with no legal consequences. It's not a crime. So, right, uh, freed, if you're not a slave, you're property. So if you're freed, then you are subject, you're outside of the law, if you remain longer than a year. So you, sh you should leave. But what if they kill you before that? Well, it's still not illegal to kill you. And what if you're a white woman that has a kid with a black man? Oh, well, you and the kid are expendable. Notice the reverse isn't true. Now, even though this didn't get enacted, the fact that he wrote it <laughs> is to again address a problem, right? Hmm. So similar in its effects, the Willie Lynch, as the Willie Lynch letter would have been on blacks, a century later in 1825, white laborers still refused to work alongside free black laborers. So it didn't matter that the law didn't, enact it, didn't get enacted, it's still uh, in effect, is affecting minds and public policy. So Jefferson was clearly of many minds with regards to race, slavery, and the rights of man. He pan penned an anti-slavery section of the Declaration of Independence where he rails against George III for supporting slavery. He has waged cruel war against human nature itself, violating its most sacred rights of life, liberty, and the, per and the persons in the persons of a distant people who never offended him, captivating and carrying them into slavery in another hemisphere or to incite miserable death in their transportation hither. This piratical warfare, the opprobrium of infidel powers, is the warfare of the Christian king of Great Britain, determined to keep, an op keep open a market where men should be bought and sold. Now wait, you're dissing George III for allowing the slave trade to happen. Wait, the slave trade that you're making money from, the slave trade that Oh, you are having sex with the, your wife's half-sister who's a slave, who looks like your wife, and you have kids with her. But your kids are in slavery. Huh. So, of course, he had slaves, as did lots of others, and that particular section was taken out. But there are nine interlocking articles of the Constitution which protect ch chattel slavery. So chattel slavery is where chattel, like rhymes with cattle, it's property, your livestock, just like Lynch referred to as stock. So nine interlocking articles of the Constitution protect slavery. So for example, one by one, this comes from Derek Bell's book, uh, And We Are Not Saved. Article 1, Section 2, representatives of the House were apportioned along the states on the basis of population computed by counting all free persons and three-fifths of the slave. This is the federal number of the three-fifths clause. That is for the purposes of representation. So in other words, the slaves themselves aren't represented. And the whole number of the slaves doesn't go to representation, it's three-fifths of the actual number, and that goes to selecting how many representatives the slave-holding states have. Get that? <laughs> All right, so blacks were three-fifths of a person. A person is defined in the sense that we the people means essentially rich white men. It didn't mean men, white women, it didn't mean Indian nations, free blacks or other people of color. Okay? Whites only. Democracy. Article 1, Section 2. And Article 1, Section 9, two clauses requiring redundantly that direct taxes, including capitations, that is, cap like your head, the head count capitations, be apportioned among the states on the foregoing basis, the purpose being to prevent Congress from laying a head tax on slaves to encourage their emancipation. Article 1, Section 9, Congress was prohibited from abolishing the international slave trade to the United States before 1808.
Article 4, Section 2, the states were prohibited from emancipating fugitive slaves who were to be returned on the demand of the master. Article 1, Section 8, Congress was empowered to provide for calling up states' militias to suppress insurrections, including slave uprisings, because slaves could be militant. Article, let's see, Article 4, Section 4, the federal government was obliged to protect the states against domestic violence, including slave insurrections. So that's the army if the state didn't have its own militia. Article 5, the provisions of Article 1, Section 9, Clauses 1 and 4, pertaining to the slave trade and direct taxes were made unamendable. Article 1, Section 9, and Article 1, Section 10, these two clauses prohibited the federal government and the states from taxing exports, one purpose being to prevent them from taxing slaves indirectly by taxing the exported products of slave labor. So this is from Derek Bell's And We're Not Saved. Uh, let me show you something. This came from Claude Anderson's book. Let's say, you know, I, I would make a bad slave. I've been told I'm just too lazy. It just, it's not that I don't like physical labor. I like it selectively. Building rock and roll stages, I like that. Gardening, that's okay. Chopping wood, that's okay. Right. But, so, otherwise I'd make a bad slave. So, <clears throat> let's say that you buy a slave for, at the time, $800. Or actually, let's say that this is a female slave, $800, and that a male slave might go for $1,200. So all you have to do, once you buy them, is feed and clothe them with hand-me-downs. Right? So then, I mean, so that last article in the Constitution, okay, which prohibits Congress from taxing stuff that's made by slaves, right? So all you have to do is feed and clothe them, and you don't even have to give them fresh food. You can give them kitchen scraps and stuff like that, and then they also have to hunt and do stuff on their own time after they're off, right? So you could essentially get for free any labor that they did, and if they made products like ironwork, woodwork, furniture, etc., etc., you could sell those at a profit. Okay? So, over the lifetime of a slave, you could make 1,500% profit. Okay, which means that, say, over the lifetime of a, say, female slave, because, oh, slavery, <laughs> this is where, you know, my Marxist friends would, might say that, you know, well, there is no such thing as moral capitalism. And I'd say, well, this is amoral capitalism, and well, you're presuming that capitalism, look, just let's not argue that, okay? Amoral capitalism. So in other words, you could get this woman pregnant that you paid $800 for, for example, right? And then sell her kids, that is, your kids, at a profit, and not feel anything about that. Like, it's okay. And that's what capitalism is kind of, American capitalism is based on. Because here's what happens with 1,500% profit. That means that each slave, over their lifetime, produces $3 million in value 
of the things you can sell from them. And of course, if it's a woman who has kids that you then sell, then that goes up. But each slave, $3 million in 19th, 17th, and 18th, and 19th century dollars, which means a <laughs> hundred times more. Later, each slave, $3 million, profit over their lifetime. Okay? So, you multiply that out, then, and it doesn't matter that you don't have slaves, you've benefited from the economy that's created from that. So, part of, then, the interlocking <laughs> articles was basically not only about money, but it's also just essentially financing a certain uh, lifestyle, shall we say. All right, so American-style capitalism. Adam Smith <clears throat> writes about the moral responsibility of the wealthy to maintain the social contract and the social fabric. Now, Adam Smith wrote, wrote among other things, The Wealth of Nations, which is one of the foundational um, textbooks, or if you will, books about supporting the idea of capitalism. He uh, was a Methodist minister. And so he says there's a moral responsibility. So profit is good, but the greater good is to use your wealth for the benefit of your community. Okay, not bad, right? So similar to belief that wealth was, similar to that belief was the wealth was a gift from God to help you do God's work of reducing misery and suffering. So profit was a good thing, and then wealth was a good thing because if you used it to, you know, like, like Yeshua said, um, basically it's easier for a rich man to, uh, it's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than a rich man to get into heaven. So kind of what he was saying is that, is, yeah, once you've got your wealth, it becomes the burden that keeps you from getting into heaven. So what you should do is give it away. So it's an old Christian concept in terms of, you know, yeah, profit's good because profit is God's gift to you to help the poor with, that is, if you do that. But in America, those moral values are said, basically were written out of the concepts of capitalism, and that is profit is good and more profit is better even if it comes at the expense of the social fabric. So, again, like my Marxist sense, my Marxist friends do not believe that capitalism can be moral. I'm saying, well, Adam Smith thought it could be. But maybe that's just a head trip. So, chattel slavery, you could buy a human female, rape her, and then sell her children, your offspring, at will, at a profit, and not feel anything about it. So this meme then becomes that people are property and i.e. human resources, not relatives. Okay? The land isn't the land, not a spiritual being in itself. It's a commodity to be bought and sold. Human beings have <clears throat> worth. The richer they are, the more worth they have. The poorer they are, the less worth they have. Huh. Uh, right? Comes straight out of slavery. Got it. This a view of capitalism, where you're building inequities into the system. All right, so American South Africa. So in America and other heirs of uh, cult European culture, racism was wedded to capitalism. And then within the, the, the tenets of Romanized Christianity. Now, I'm not saying just Roman Catholic. Roman Catholicism, but Romanized Christianity. So, we discover the non-Christian world and it's our property, because God said so. If we baptize them first, it's okay to kill non-white children or sell them into slavery. So, for example, Irish and Scots people were not considered white then either. They were considered heathen and pagan and sold into slavery alongside blacks in West Indies, etc. 
Okay, the Highland Clearances was one example of this. So, the Highland Clearances is not a clothing sale. It is ethnic cleansing in the British Isles. God said it's okay. So the idea of what happened to black slaves did not just happen to black slaves, it happened to what we people we would call white people too, at the same time. Right? And that's kind of been erased from history as well. Right? Because a lot of people, yeah, well, I'm Irish and Scottish. I said, so do you understand? Do you, you have you ever heard of the Highland Clearances? Well, no. Well, what happened? Did we talk about the Riot Act? No. <laughs> Okay, so many of the features that we have today in American law came from this time, which during the colonial period, which was preceded by the British colonial period, because America was essentially a British colony. So one of the things that happened during this time is the Irish and Scots people had not been converted necessarily to Christianity all the way through. So Britain is called, let's get away from the slavery thing for a second and then return to it. Britain means land of cows or cattle. You know that statement that uh, George W. Bush is all hat and no cattle? <laughs> cowboy, all hat, no cattle? Okay, you're really a real cowboy if you have cattle, right? Well, Britain, land of cattle, your wealth was determined by the size of your herd, okay? Because cows gave you milk, cows gave you leather, etc., etc. More cows you had, wealthier you were, okay? But, the Irish and Scots people could not own the land. The land was owned by the king. Right? So this is feudalism before capitalism. So they do have money. So money was this silver, silver was the metal, but it was called mayo. All right? So the Irish and Scots people had to pay rent with their mail. Now what would happen is that the English would rustle the cattle. And so then they would have to buy their own cattle herd back with the rent money. Hence the term black mail. Okay, and what's black mail today? Paying money to do something, wait, you already had it, or to keep you from releasing information, but that was where the term came from. This practice, blackmail, where you had to buy your own cattle back that were stolen by the British landlords. Now, if you protested this, so for example, Irish and Scots people are known for a particular type of cloth which is woven and colored in a certain pattern, which is called what? A tartan? A tartan yeah, okay. Flat. So, it was illegal to wear tartan. It was illegal to speak Gaelic. All right? And sometimes by wearing tartans or wearing or speaking Gaelic, you could be killed. So, when they read you the Riot Act, what the Riot Act was, was you can't in three or more is a riot. When you're protesting having to get by your cattle back, raising your voice, that's a riot. Three or more, that's a riot. Wearing tartan, speaking Gaelic, is a riot. Raising your voice is a riot. So, for example, in the Highland Clearances, which was ethnic cleansing, you kill all the men, and then you sell the women and children into slavery. Where would you do that? Where would they go? Ah, the West Indies or America. Which is why you have Gaelic speaking people in Jamaica today with red hair. Because once you sell them into the West Indies, into slavery, 
no British gentleman, no British landowner or plantation owner is going to marry an Irish slave. It's beneath them. So what, who are they going to intermarry with? Oh, well, the black people. Which is why, yeah, you have Gaelic speaking, red haired and mixed race black people in Jamaica and the West Indies today because of this practice of the British selling Irish and Scots people after genocidal wars and all that other kind of stuff into slavery. So again, this is another hidden history. The Riot Act, three or more, etc. It's a fascinating history. And God, of course, said it's okay to do this, so. Back to slide, thank you. Or we said, God said it's okay. <laughs> Whoever we is. So I want to start talking about a uh, certain tradition um, the Maro Njuka Maroons who uh, were uh, inhabiting northern South America uh, in Suriname, among others. Uh, this is, uh, there are three Maroon leaders. So Maroon society, Maroon means wild and free in a Taino language. And it refers to specifically uh, descendants of African uh, slaves who escaped slavery and started free societies. So slaves can escape slavery, but they can't necessarily, unless they know how to create a free society, they're going to replicate the society that Massa created. But Maroons actually took that a step farther and actually created actual republics. That is where you defend yourself militarily against foreign incursion, and that means the slavers. So this happened in a number of places. So every place there was chattel slavery in the Americas had a maroon society, whether they called themselves that or not. So there are, there are three maroon leaders in front of the White House. Uh, Njuka, uh, the, man, the brother on the left from Suriname, a Seminole, which uh, I noticed that he's we wearing Western garb, right? So Seminole basically literally means a mixture of black and Native Americans. That, that's what the word means in their language. And it basically people who are who flew, black slaves who fled in the swamps and then intermarried with the Native people there. Yeah? So the Seminoles weren't an, an original Native American tribe. Right. They were probably like Creeks. Right. I always yeah. thought that, yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah, because the Creeks, like, we're all through. Like, a Alabama's a Creek word. Okay. <laughs> Georgia is named after George, right? right? Mm -hmm. Florida is a native word, as is, you know, <clears throat> Tennessee, mm -hmm. Cherokee, was actually a Cherokee city, Tennessee, Tennessee, right? So all those weird-sounding names that can't be English, those were Native American words. Tuscaloosa, Tuscarora. So, so Seminoles would be a combination of an original Native American tribe and escaped black slaves. Yeah, basically. yeah. And uh, a Jamaican maroon. So, yeah. about how old would you say Seminole that is? Like? Um, from the time of the Spanish. And, you know, because it's the Spanish that are bringing folks in there first. I, and older, right? So they're escaping, and they're escaping Mexico, they're escaping into Florida, where you know, the Spanish are, and they're, basically it's the Seminoles that caused the Spanish to sell Florida to the British, because they couldn't get them out. Yeah. I think that was like 15th or 16th century. Right. Will Sarvis covers that in his yeah. history class. Yes, right. Yeah, exactly. So yeah, we saw the Njuka Maroon. That's uh, from the from Suriname. This is Moore Town in Jamaica, which is a um, basically modern day picture. Though you can't necessarily see the settlement or the city, but that's you know 
what, what town where. <laughs> so maroon. So Africans are not strangers to firearms. Actually, we had been trading with the Chinese long before Marco Polo, and some of us had 50 years firearms 50 years before Europeans brought them to Africa. Um, so we're not strangers to, to, to diplomacy or warfare with Europeans, and not strangers to exploration. So maroonage was one particular response to slavery. Uh, it has particular power because in the case of uh, the Republic of Palmares in Brazil and other quilombos, a quilombo is a, a Brazilian, Portuguese, or a native word for a fortified city. So Palmares was the largest of the quilombos, and there are some quilombos today. <clears throat> so you can defend basically a land base. And you could escape into Indian country, so Mexico, the whaling industry, shipping industry, or piracy. These were some of the responses to slavery and some of the havens. So Indian country, Mexico, uh, whaling industry, uh, shipping, or piracy. So, arr, matey. So, despite, yeah, go ahead, Eddie. Would, would their ability to, to organize maroon republics be kind of an echo or remnant of um, the ancient African legal structures mm -hmm. way back in Kemet time? Mm -hmm. is, that could be like a, an epigenetic impulse? Yes, it could be. Particularly, and I'm not sure if I have it here, but it should be here, um, Nanny and the Maroon. So Nanny was a warrior queen but also a, an elder in Jamaica. So she's on the Jamaican $500 bill. So she told Africa, African stories and then also organized uh, warfare uh, against the British. And basically, um, I think later on this slide also talks about um, kind of what that response is. But let's get through this brother here first. <clears throat> so, one response to slavery was piracy. There were no all-white pirate crews, Disney notwithstanding. Historical record doesn't indicate there were white, all-white pirate crews. Like, nowhere. Never. Not happening. Okay, so one African pirate captain, Lawrence de Graaf, who was a Dutch citizen, was captured and enslaved by the Spanish, and managed to capture and take over most of the fleet that had enslaved him before it got to Cuba. <laughs> in fact, in the record of slavery, there was 150 documented slave rebellions at sea on slave ships. Now, some of them were successful, and here's what I mean by successful. Successful means you free yourself, you kill the crew, all of them, and you sell yourself back to Africa. So there were a few of those. Amistad was a failed rebellion because they failed to kill the crew. They let the crew live and the crew deceived them instead of, at night, the Africans, like it was depicted in the Steven Spielberg mo movie, the, though I don't necessarily always trust Steven to tell the entire story the way we would tell it. At least in Amistad, he got part of it right, where at night, the Africans would sail themselves accurately back to Africa, and by day, the crew would sail them back towards the American coast. So at night, they're sailing back to Africa, <laughs> and by day, they're sailing back to the American coast, and they go zigzagging up the coast from Cuba until they get caught in Connecticut, and then have that adventure, which we'll talk about when we get to the 1800s here. So Lawrence de Graff. So this, is, this brother is actually acting out Lawrence de Graff's part. So Lawrence de Graff. Arguably the most talented and feared corsair, corsair is another name for pirate, usually corsairs are uh, Arab or Muslim pirates, 
off the coast of Africa. Uh, so this is basically you know, the, the, the convention of referring to a black person or a, per, or a darker person of color as a corsair or a moor. Right? Nearly a quarter century, his name, whether pronounced Lorencio in the Spanish or simply Lorenz, was whispered in awe and dread whenever a strange sail approached and was included in the prayers and petitions of many Spanish coastal town in Mexico and elsewhere. So far more successful than Kidd or Blackbeard, Lawrence is nonetheless far less famous than either. This is from a private paper written by Ken Kinkor, who's historian of the Waida, which is the only pirate shipwreck ex excavated to date. So what happened with the graph? So, he was an ex-slave, was also knighted by the French, French as Major Lawrence Corneal Baldran, Sir de Graff, Lieutenant du, of Duroy, in Lyle de Saint-Dominique, Saint Dominique is now known as Haiti, Captain de Frigate Leguerre, Chevalier de Saint-Louis. So, what I didn't say about him, here's where, here's where de Graff came from. He was a French citizen, Dutch citizen, Captured and enslaved by the Spanish, took over the slave ship that took, you know, there's like three ships in the fleet, and he took them over, one by one. And from then on, he didn't sail himself back to, uh, he's like from Cape Verde, I think, Cape Verde Islands, some island off the coast of Africa. Uh, and from then on, he didn't sail himself back to Africa. From then on, he basically, uh, let's say he was enthusiastic about Spanish slavers in particular. And so he would find them, seek and destroy them, and basically give the slaves the choice of joining him or joining the crew in death. Want to be free, live free, or do you want to die? So, his fleet naturally would grow with slave ships, because if you're seeking out Spanish slavers, yeah. So, he never lost a battle at sea, even when hopelessly outnumbered and was only defeated once on land in 1695 when an Anglo Hispanic, that is, two enemies, the British and Spain invaded Haiti, okay, which was a French colony at the time, right? Force of 3,200 folks. So he wasn't captured, but his wife and children were. And he was shipped to France, accused of treason in the defeat. Wait, he's outnumbered. The French, he's basically got his pirate crew. The French aren't coming to his aid, even though it's a French colony. So they blame him for losing the battle because they weren't sending troops to back it up and accuse him of treason. Yeah, right. The French wouldn't have won in any case, but they needed a scapegoat and the brother is the scapegoat, right? So his success as a pirate financially was unmatched by any historical pirate not of his race, though the white ones, of course, made ink and uh, an infamy of heated. So he particularly targeted Spanish shipping, and after his court martial in France, he was allowed to retire in what was now, then French territory, but is now Biloxi, Mississippi, and buried in an unmarked grave, I think. Uh, this is a, a graphic I asked uh, Ken for, basically showing uh, the deck of a pirate ship. And again, it was his material that suggested, well, no, there's, there's no all-white crews. That's Disney. <laughs> Blacks escape slavery by going into piracy, among other things, as the, and the whaling industry and other things. So, the symbolism. Death and rebirth on the account. So, jolly in Old English meant brave, like for he's a jolly good fellow, or also the jolly Roger. So, the idea behind, the symbolism behind this 
flag here. Obviously, the skull means death, but the two femurs, the cross femurs, mean standing up on your own. Because basically, well, you, as you'll see, symbolism of the pirate flag remember, represents death and rebirth. So this is an African theme that we've seen with the Njuka Maroons. Death and then rebirth. Because it's a cycle. Death because pirates saw themselves as being dead to oppressive colonial and European societies. They also knew a certain <clears throat> death to be captured by any quote-unquote civilized power other than the ones who occasionally hired them to attack enemy shipping, like with de Graaf. French enlisted him to attack the Spanish, etc., etc. Okay, so the cross thigh bones represented rebirth, standing free on your own two feet. So pirate ships were floating democracies in the old school sense of democracy. Every member of the crew had voting rights while on the account. The account, basically every crew member had an equal share of all <coughs> captured goods. The crew could override the captain's decision by a vote. And so, again, what the, so the captain owned the ship, but the crew basically determined, okay, where are we going with the ship? 